Well, let's open God's Word now. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Today we will conclude our study in this letter from the Apostle Paul to his son in the faith, Timothy, as he instructs him on how to shepherd the people of God and to bring into order what needed to be brought into order in a church that had a lot of problems. It's been a wonderful study. We are 24 weeks into this study, but today we bring it to a close with this phrase, taking hold of life. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, I'll begin reading in verse 17, if you would just follow along in your copy of God's Word. Paul says this, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good. They are to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. This is God's Word. Would you pray with me before we study it together? Father, I do thank you for your Word. I thank you for this gathering of your people to study your Word and to uh, be moved and changed and uh, to be impacted by it. So I pray that your Spirit would move among us. Uh, Apart from your Spirit moving in our midst, apart from your Spirit applying the truth of your Word to our hearts, we can walk from this place completely unchanged, completely unmoved by what we hear and what is said. And so, Lord, I pray that you would come and move among us and accomplish your purpose. I thank you for the brothers and sisters who are here. I thank you for those who are here who have not yet come to know you as Savior. And, Lord, I pray that they would hear the gospel clearly today and be confronted by their need of a Savior and the overwhelming love of your kindness to them would draw them to you. Lord, do what you will. And use me, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1965, there was a young rock band from England that recorded a song that summed up thousands of years of human frustration. That band was the Rolling Stones, and the song was, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. Y'all know that song? A few of you do. The song describes man's frustration in the pursuit of satisfaction. And just when we think that we have everything we need, an ad comes on TV telling us that there's something that we don't have that's going to make us better, more of a man, more accomplished, more satisfied. The song was written by Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, and they tapped into the frustration that no matter how much we have, and no matter how good we think life is in a particular moment, there's still this constant nagging reality that satisfaction is just beyond our reach. It goes like this, I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. I try and I try and I try and I try, but I can't get no satisfaction. No, no, no. It's just not there. So whatever words you might use, satisfaction or happiness or fulfillment or the true meaning of life, no matter how you describe it, this longing is something that all of humanity shares. The single greatest longing in the human heart is to be satisfied. And we all seek it in different ways. We seek fulfillment in a career, perhaps, or we seek happiness in wealth, or we seek satisfaction in sexual pleasure or fame or power or But for all of our longing and all of our pursuing, we come up short time and time again. We we seek fulfillment with all of our energy, and then for a brief moment, we think we have it. We have the job we wanted, we have the house we wanted, we have the car and the spouse, and then we see something that someone else has, and we realize it's just out of reach again. I'm, I'm not fond of much of what this man says, but... I am fond of this particular statement. Jim Carrey, the actor, comedian, he identified this human longing when he said this, I think that everybody should get rich and famous and do everything that they dreamed of so that they can see that it's not the answer. He's saying, 
Not that the pursuit itself is the problem, but the things that we are pursuing are the problem. They do not have the ability, the things of this world do not have the ability to provide us with the satisfaction and fulfillment that we're all seeking. And maybe you're there, maybe you've been there, maybe you're there right now, thinking you've got it all, but there's something else there. Or maybe you're just at that place where you're languishing, and you don't know what the meaning and purpose and fulfillment in life truly is. Well, friend, you've come to the right place, because right here, in the last few lines of 1 Timothy, we see that there is a way to take hold of that which we are seeking. God is telling us that the way to to grasp what our hearts truly long for will require us to abandon one pursuit in favor of another. It requires us to abandon one hope for the sake of pursuing a hope and a wealth that will never run out. So let's look at this. Let's look at a Christian's approach to wealth. Back in verse 17, Paul says to the the church, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Now I believe that this is true of us as Americans, probably not just us as Americans, but I think it's true that we all think that if we had a little more money, we would be okay. We'd be happier. We think that wealth has a, the ability to drive our problems away. And we may not say it out loud, although some of us might, but we feel it in our hearts. And the Bible has a lot to say about money and about wealth. The Bible does not condemn wealth, nor does it condemn the rich. It does not instruct us to take a vow of poverty, but it does warn us time and time again about the dangers associated with making money the chief goal and hope of our lives. Earlier in this chapter, we were warned about the dangers of loving money, and I mean uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul wrote this, he, he said, those who desire to be rich, those who make it their desire and their longing to be rich, they fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Pretty strong words there. And then he explains why that is the case. Why is it that a desire for these things will result in ruin and destruction? Because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So earlier in this chapter, in verses 9 and 10, Paul was addressing those who were, they had a desire to be rich. In other words, they, they were not wealthy, but they wanted to be. And then here, in verses 17 and 19, he's addressing those who are rich. And he's warning them not to let their wealth lead them into sin. He tells them, don't be haughty. Which, when's the last time you used that word? It's probably been a while since you used the word haughty. Haughty means a type of arrogance. A type of self-importance. This is one of the dangers of finding your identity in your wealth. It has a tendency to puff us up and and put our hope in ourselves and have a a high opinion of ourselves. It causes people who are wealthy to look down on those who are not wealthy. And maybe you've experienced this, maybe you haven't, but there's actually science to back this up. Research published in the Journal of Psychological Science has identified ways that wealth impacts our behavior in, in a negative sense. According to the research conducted, and I won't give you all of it, But here are five things that it says happens to those who are wealthy or tends to happen to those who are wealthy. Number one, people with more money tend to be less compassionate toward others, especially those less fortunate. Number two, wealth clouds moral judgment because the decisions that help to gain wealth are often void of moral constraints. Number three, wealth is often linked with addiction because money gives greater access to more socially acceptable drugs and the stress associated with pursuing wealth causes people to seek comfort in addictive outlets. Money itself can also become addictive. That's number four, because the pursuit of wealth can itself become a compulsive behavior. And then number five, wealthy children 
are by far more troubled with anxiety, depression, substance abuse, eating disorders, and other troubles because of the expectation that they are to excel at everything. So the desire to be rich and that idea that it's going to solve all your problems, guess what? It doesn't. It creates a whole new host of problems. Rather than eliminating our problems, wealth has a way of increasing our problems, right? But from a sin perspective, Paul says that wealthy people are tempted to be arrogant toward others. This is pride, plain and simple. Being wealthy and powerful can breed a huge sense of self-importance. That's one of the dangers of wealth. And, and we've experienced that at some level. How many videos have you seen where some rich or socially powerful person has been pulled over by the police and the first thing out of their mouth is, do you know who I am? Do you know how important I am? I'm not subject to the same rules as everyone else. They are puffed up with conceit. Wealth and power has a tendency to do that in a sinful heart. Now there's another danger. The second danger that is common to those who are rich is that not only have a, a false sense of self, but they have a false sense of security. Paul says they have set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. And Paul is taking this straight from the Lord Jesus. Jesus taught that wealth is uncertain because it is subject to moth and rust and thieves. Right? We could add to that list of moth, moth, rust, and thieves inflationary government spending. Market instability, soaring gas prices. I, I saw a meme yesterday my wife showed me. It was um, the most expensive vehicle in America right now is a shopping cart in a grocery store. <laughs> you think you've got more wealth and then it just keeps going out the door. How many investors have gone to bed with money in the bank and woken up with virtually nothing? When we put our hope and trust in something that can so easily be taken away from us, we have banked our future on something out of our control. And yet we do it. And, and Paul is telling us here that the answer is not to find some other thing to put our hope in, but to put our hope in a person. Not in wealth, but in God Himself. He says, do not set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Going back to the introduction, there is nothing in creation that can ultimately satisfy the need of our soul. Only our Creator can do this. That's the point. And the Creator is generous. Our God is generous and merciful. He announces Himself in the book of Exodus, and he tells us who he is. He says, I am merciful and gracious and abounding in steadfast love toward those who love me. And he wants us, according to this, and all that we've seen in Scripture, he wants us to enjoy the gifts of creation that he has given to us. But he alone is able to meet the deepest need of our souls. He alone. The dangers of wealth are false pride and false security. And I don't know if you noticed this, but these things can cause us to violate the two basic principles of the faith. It can cause us to love money more than we love God, and it can cause us to look down on our neighbors rather than to love them. And Christ says, no, these are the greatest commandments, to love God and love your neighbor. And wealth takes over, corrupts both of those. But there is a type of wealth that we should be pursuing. In verse 18, look at that text. They are to do good. In other words, those who are wealthy are not to put their hopes in the Lord, but to put their hopes, I mean, not to put their hopes in wealth, but in the Lord. And the, re the reaction or response is that we are to do good and to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share. And by doing so, we're storing up treasures for ourselves as a good foundation for the future so that we may take hold of that which is truly life. So instead of pursuing one type of wealth, we are to pursue another type of wealth. There's a shift there. And, and Paul uses the same word multiple times here. Uh, he uses the word rich or riches, and I'll, I'll state it for you. He says that those who are rich in this present world should not put their hope in the uncertainty of worldly riches, but all believers should put our hope in God who richly provides us with what we need, and this leads us to be rich in good works. 
So there's this big, massive play on words here. And he wants us to shift our focus from the riches of this world to the riches of the world that is to come. That's how we should approach wealth as the people of God. We should use our resources, of which God has been abundantly generous to us, we should use our resources to be generous to others. Generous with our finances, generous with our time, generous with whatever we have. We should be generous in our support of our brothers and sisters, our family as a church. We should be generous in the support of the work of the gospel. We should be rich in good works, which shows that we value the work of the gospel more than we value the work that puts money in our bank accounts. We should be generous, ready to share with those around us that have needs. And in all of this, what we're doing is we are imitating our Heavenly Father who is rich beyond imagination. And yet, He richly provides us with everything we need. But that's not all that we see in this text. Not only do we we see an approach to wealth as Christians, but we also see how we can take hold of life. Look back at verse 19. He says, By doing these things, we can store up treasure for ourselves as a good foundation for the future so that we may take hold of that which is truly life. The picture there is you've got this understanding of this being the meaning of life, this being the good, the good stuff that life has to offer, but there's a life that is more truly life and that's what we should be pursuing. Not the temporal, but the spiritual and eternal. Okay, we, maybe you've heard this. We, you often hear, That as Americans, we are the wealthiest nation in the world. You heard this statement? Well, there's actually numbers to back this up as well. The the average U.S. family, and again, this is a large average, but the average U.S. family has a net worth of $176,000, while the next nation on the list, Switzerland, has an average family net worth of $128,000. U.S. families have, on average, an annual disposable income of $44,000 per year. Now, maybe that's not you. Again, this is an average. And that average of $44,000 worth of disposable income every year is far above the next few countries on the list. We earn more money on average and have more disposable income on average than any other country on the planet. And so, in in a very real sense, we are all wealthy by biblical standards, by world's standards. But here's the question. How do we use that money? What percentage of money do we spend on increasing our lifestyle rather than giving to others or supporting gospel work? Right? If we're, if we're supposed to be not investing in that which moth, rust, and thieves can take, but investing in a wealth that is stored up in heaven, that's a good question for us to ask. How much of our wealth do we spend on increasing our lifestyle rather than on giving to support others or the the work of the gospel? Have you ever heard of a man by the name of George Mueller? I know some of you have. Uh, Mueller was a Christian evangelist, missionary. He was a founder of an orphanage in Bristol, England, and that orphanage cared for more than 2,000 children. He is most known as being a man of incredible prayer, who never solicited funds for the support of his ministry, but he simply prayed and relied on God to provide the needs. And God provided for the needs of his family and his ministry for years and years and years to come. If you've never read a small little biography of George Mueller, highly recommend that you do so. Um, But there's one thing about Mueller's life that we tend to overlook. And it's the fact that even as the Lord put massive sums of money in his hands... George Mueller lived a very simple life, choosing to give away nearly all of the money that came into his hands. Here's some statistics. In 1874, Mueller received 3,100 pounds in donations, but he and his family only used 250 pounds for themselves. He lived on 8% of what he received and gave the remaining 92% away to support orphans and missionaries. And this is just an example, right? This is just one way that an individual chose to invest in 
the treasure of heaven rather than the treasure of earth. To put that in today's money, if the 250 pounds were equivalent to, let's say, $25,000, then Mueller would have received, in that year alone, $310,000, but he gave away $285,000 and he lived on twenty five. From 1870 on, George Mueller personally fully supported, fully supported 20 missionaries with the China Inland Mission. And over the years from 1831 to 1885, he gave away roughly 86% of his income to the Lord's work. I just want you to rest on that for a minute. Because that convicted me as I'm reading it and thinking about it. This man trusted God. He used his wealth to store up treasure in heaven. And in a very real sense, he had come to understand what it meant to truly take hold of that which is life. The American instinct tells us that when our income increases, our standard of living should increase. The materialism of our culture has seeped down in our hearts so much so that when we have disposable income, the first thing we think is, what can I go and buy now? Rather than, How can I give? How can I help someone else? In a not-so-subtle way, we've learned that investing in this, this life is the way to go. And Paul comes in and he tells us, no, you need to learn to invest in that which is truly life. Jesus tells us that life, true life, does not consist in the abundance of our possessions. You've probably heard that statement. He said this right before uh, he told a parable about a rich fool who... who had a lot of money come his way and then he invested in just storing up everything he could so that he could sit back and live the rest of his life in peace and rest. His goal was to lay up treasure on this earth and Jesus called him a fool because his soul was required of him. So what is more valuable? To be rich in this present life or to be rich in the age to come? That's what Paul is teaching us here. Taking hold of that which is truly life is to invest our money, our time, our energy, and our lives in the kingdom. It's to give our lives for the work of the gospel and to use our resources to win souls for Christ. And, and just in case you're there wondering, all right, pastor, when are you going to pass the plate? We're not, there's no campaign here. I'm not campaigning for money. This is God's word. We're not asking for anything. I'm calling all of us, myself included, to be faithful. The pursuit of the kingdom's wealth is what should drive us each day. And this is the pursuit that Timothy is to be fueled by as well. Look at verse 20. Look at the inheritance that he has to give. Paul says, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. We've been studying for weeks and weeks about the false teaching that was stirring up there. And he's telling him, just avoid that altogether and be faithful to guard the deposit entrusted to you because by going after these other things and professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Now, it might seem like these two concepts, these two ideas are disconnected from one another, but they're not. Paul sticks with the same theme of wealth even here as he issues his final charge to Timothy. He tells him to guard the deposit entrusted to him. And that phrase is a monetary term. So he's sticking with this idea of money. He's saying, look, you have been given this deposit. It's been entrusted to you. And this is a kind of wealth that has been entrusted to you, Timothy. Guard it, protect it, and use it for kingdom purposes. All the wealth that resides in Timothy resides in his faith in Christ and his calling to shepherd the people of God. And he says, guard that and use it well. Like all believers, Timothy has been blessed by God with faith in Christ. And his faith in Christ is more valuable than anything that this world can afford. Let's talk about that faith. In Christ, for the believer, all of our debts have been paid. Sticking with that monetary theme. All of our debts have been paid. The wages of sin have been covered by the death of Christ. In Christ, all the wealth of heaven has been spent to set us free and to ensure our inheritance in heaven. The temptation for Timothy, just like us, was to squander his faith by chasing after what the world affords, by chasing after false doctrine or giving in to false teaching. And Paul tells him to guard the faith 
and preserve the truth and pass it on to others. And that calling rests on us as well. Our inheritance as the people of God is primarily a spiritual one. It is the truth of God once for all delivered to the saints. The world wants to take it from us or cause us to abandon it, but we know that our faith in Christ is, like Jesus said in the parables, it's the pearl of great price. It is the one thing that we will sell everything for just so that we can obtain it. Is that the way you view your faith in Christ? Do you trust God with your eternity? Of course you do. Why is it so hard for us to trust God with our lives here and now? Which kingdom are we living for? What type of satisfaction are we pursuing? The kind that's always out of reach? Or the kind that has richly provided us through Christ? In conclusion, we have been taught that we can find peace and satisfaction through consumerism and materialism, as though those things can be purchased in a store or online. We seek fulfillment in every cause under the sun. We seek purpose in philosophies that don't even make sense. And I'm talking about modern philosophies. Our culture has pushed the boundaries on sexual freedom to absurd places and demand universal affirmation, thinking that acceptance will bring satisfaction and fulfillment. But it won't. The things of this world can't satisfy you because they weren't made to. Have you ever wondered why the most pleasurable experiences in life only leave you longing for more? We don't eat the greatest steak of our lives and then say, I never want steak again. We just want to go back as soon as we can. That's the way it works here. True satisfaction. Think about this. True satisfaction would be finding something so good and so pleasurable and so fulfilling that the longing in your heart for it would be completely quenched forever. But everything we experience in this life, even the best things that we experience in this life, they just leave us longing for more. I don't quote him often, but C.S. Lewis got it right when he said this, If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. The satisfaction that you are seeking that we are all seeking is not found in a philosophy or an Amazon wish list. It's not found in the pursuit of pleasure or power or money. The satisfaction that all of humanity is seeking is found in Christ alone. Christianity does not primarily offer a philosophy to meet our intellectual needs, nor a religious system as a means to find fulfillment. Christianity offers a person, the Son of God and the Savior of His people, Jesus Christ. So brother, sister, only Christ can truly satisfy the longing in our souls. Only He can bring the true and lasting peace that we all need. And if you're a believer in Christ, then remember that Christ is enough, more than enough. There is no hurt He cannot mend. There is no sin He hasn't forgiven. There is no dream that can surpass all that He has planned for those who love Him. And if you're an unbeliever, I'm going to use a weird illustration here, I want to urge you to get off the treadmill and rest. Our pursuit of fulfillment and satisfaction in this world is like running on a treadmill. All right, you know what it's like to run on a treadmill. You get on, you get your heart rate up, you get really sweaty, you're exhausted by the end, but when you step down, you haven't gone anywhere. You're in the same place that you started. You've just been running in place. And pursuing satisfaction in the things of the world is just like that. A lot of effort, a lot of sweat, a lot of worry, a lot of anxiety, and at the end of that pursuit, you find yourself in the same exact spot. Are you fed up with pursuing what the world tells you will bring you satisfaction, but only leaves you empty-handed at the end? If you are, then good, because that is the precondition needed to seek the one who can truly satisfy. A person has to be thoroughly disgusted with the way things are, to find the motivation to set out on the Christian way. As long as we think the next election might eliminate crime and establish justice, or another scientific breakthrough might save the environment, or another pay raise might push us over the edge of anxiety into a life of tranquility, we are not likely to pursue a life of faith. A person has got to get fed up with the ways of the world before he or before she acquires an appetite for the world of grace. 
And that's not my words, that's from Eugene Peterson. So, stop striving to fill your soul with things that can't satisfy. And instead, turn to the only one who can fill the longing and satisfy the desires and bring you true and lasting peace. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for your word. Your word that comforts us, but also confronts us. And more often than not, we need to be confronted by our, the false hopes we've put our heart, our, set our hearts on or the, the, the false pursuits that consume our days. But Lord, let us find our hope and joy and peace in you and what you've done for us and what you've provided for us. And let that not just be a once for all thing, but let that satisfaction motivate us and, and, and cause us to not cling to the things of this world, but to use them as resources for the gospel to use them to be a blessing to others. Let us be conduits of your blessing and let those blessings flow through us to to the benefit of others. Help us to be kingdom-minded so that we can really, truly grasp the life that you have for your people. Father, would you do this in our hearts? Would you do this in our midst? Would you accomplish this and, and all of your purposes through the preaching of your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing.